Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, all. Uh, so for today, uh, in this last lecture, I will finally touch upon the title of my series of lectures. So we'll talk about generic cluster characters. But we'll start by recalling what we've done previously. Uh, we've defined yesterday uh, the, uh, we've seen what the definition of the cluster character is uh, inside the cluster category. So let me write the formula down again. The reason for this is that we'll still make some computations in examples, so it might be a good idea to have the formula on the board. Uh, so let Q be a finite acyclic quiver. CQ be its cluster category. And say T be a basic cluster tilting object inside. Then the cluster character takes an object and sends it to a Laurent polynomial, which turns out in a lot of cases to be a cluster variable or a cluster monomial. So the cluster character is defined as follow, as follows. So if you take any object x in your cluster category, then you send it to a Laurent polynomial Define first, you have a monomial in front of it, taking into account the index of x. And then you multiply by the f polynomial evaluated in something. But I will uh, write it down explicitly. It's the sum over all dimension vectors, the Euler characteristic of the Grassmannian of dimension vector e of f of x. Recall that f is a functor from home CQ, from CQ to mod and T, and sending an object X to the space of morphisms from T to the suspension of X. <clears throat> and then you multiply by y hat to the power e. Recall that y i hat is a monomial, a Laurent monomial in the x i is defined by the quiver q t. x j to the power number of arrows from j to i in q t minus the number of arrows from i to j in q t. So this is the formula. And this cluster character induces bijections. Between the set of indecomposable rigid objects in CQ up to isomorphism and the cluster variables in the cluster algebra defined by the quiver of T. And if instead of talking about indecomposable rigid objects, you talk about cluster tilting objects, then you get the correspondence between uh, cluster tilting objects and clusters in AQT. Uh, we also saw yesterday that if you have a cluster tilting object, 
then uh, you can mutate it at any, uh, at any index from 1 to n. So say that a cluster tilting object is reachable from t if you can obtain it by mutating t a finite number of time. And from there you see that I've left a blank space here. I've done this yesterday as well, but I forgot to fill it in. Uh, the clusters in the cluster algebra will be in bijection with the set of reachable cluster tilting objects in general. So I will add the word reachable. If you restrict yourself to the cluster category of an acyclic quiver, this is not necessary. But if you want to go in the generalized cluster category, the correct step is obtained by adding the word reachable and say that an indecomposable or yes let's say a rigid object is reachable if you can obtain it by uh, taking direct, sum, direct sums of direct sum ends of one reachable cluster tilting object. If it is in T prime, T prime, a reachable cluster tilting object. And so with this, indecomposable, reachable, rigid objects up to isomorphism become in bijection with cluster variables. <clears throat> okay, so these are recollections with an added remark. Now let's start with the last section of this series, generic cluster characters. To motivate this, uh, I will review some results on cluster algebras. So 3.1 will be results on a special case, the special case of the Kronecker quiver. The basis for the cluster algebra of the Kronecker quiver. The general problem that one could want to solve, and that was one of the problems that interested Fuhrman and Zelivinsky in their papers. So given a cluster algebra, say A contained by the Laurent phenomenon in the Laurent polynomial rings, ring in n variables, Given this, well, this algebra is, of course, a three abelian group. And you'd like to find a basis of this three abelian group. So find a basis of A as a Z module. <clears throat> so you have a cluster algebra, this is a ring. Forget the ring structure, only remember uh, the structure given by the sum. This gives you an abelian group. It's free, find a basis. <coughs> this is a difficult problem in general. Uh, but in order to, we, we can solve it in some cases, and we know 
I'm going to give you the answer at least for the Kronecker quiver, yes. But for this, let me just make sure that we know the definition of a cluster monomial. I think it's been defined, it's probably been defined last week, but just to make sure, a cluster monomial, a cluster monomial is a product of cluster variables that all belong to the same cluster. Of course, <clears throat> cluster variables are cluster monomials. And one should not forget that one is a cluster monomial because it is an empty product. Now, why do I define cluster monomials? Uh, the main reason is that in all bases, all interesting Z bases of cluster algebras, the cluster monomials will appear. The simplest case is when the cluster algebra is of finite type. So if the quiver is of Dinkin type ADE, and it's a theorem of Sherman and Zelewinski, that in this case, the cluster monomials form the basis of the cluster algebra. So if Q is of Dinkin type, ADE, then the cluster monomials form a basis. cluster algebra. I checked yesterday, yes. Sorry? Uh, the, that is, uh, yes, thank you, that's for rank two, yes. But. But, the, but the, so they checked for rank two, and who did it for Dinkin types? Uh, okay, can you say? Caldero and co-authors. Caldero and? And one? And other people, yes, yes. But I, I was hoping. Caldero et al. Is that fine? I could not hear who it was. But, uh, it was you, really. <laughs> Why didn't you say so? I mean, <laughs> Caldero has written with a lot of people, you know. <clears throat> Anyhow. You're right, thank you. <laughs> now, uh, cluster monomials you can categorify, yes, because remember that if you have a direct sum of objects in the cluster category, then applying the cluster character gives you a product of cluster characters. So if you want a cluster monomial, all you have to do is take several indecomposable, reachable, rigid objects that their direct sums and apply the cluster character. So on this side, you get that reachable rigid objects in CQ up to isomorphism are in bijection with cluster monomials. <clears throat> 
this is for all finite types, so Dinkin types. Assuming the quiver is connected. Uh, what about the Kronecker quiver? <coughs> and this time, I will mention Shaman Zelivinsky and Ceruli Irelli, who generalized it to any affine type A. Uh, so if this time Q is the Kronecker quiver, And in this case, a basis of the cluster algebra contains the cluster monomials, but that's not enough. You're missing some elements. Uh, so a Z basis of the cluster algebra is given as follows. So first, you have all cluster monomials, but that's not enough. You have powers of one additional element, which I'll call Z. And this element can be explicitly written down as the following Laurent polynomial. Yes. Now, cluster monomials are categorified by reachable rigid objects. And the question is, can we categorify this guy? this, maybe I need a bit more space. <clears throat> well, if we want to know whether we can categorify it, we'll need to look again at the cluster category. Recall what the cluster category looks like. You have projectives somewhere, and then you have an infinite component, some tubes, when I say some, I mean a, a P1 family of tubes. And then it goes on on the other side. And so this is the module category. And recall that you have one added slice that corresponds to the shifted projective. And this slice glues the two sides together. So the two orange bands are equal. So that's the cluster category. That's what the cluster category for the Kronecker quiver looks like. Now, when we categorified all cluster variables, what did we use? We use all indecomposable rigid objects. And all indecomposable rigid objects, they live in this infinite band, yes? Because if you start with your initial cluster tilting object, and you mutate. Whenever you mutate, you just move like this in your auslander quiver. So you get all objects on this side. Or maybe you mutated on the other side. Then you move like this. Or you were like this, and you move like this. And you mutate, and you mutate, and you mutate. And you get all possible modules that appear here. Yes. So all of these. These were rigid in the composable objects. So these are all sent to cluster variables. <coughs> and then you had a lot of objects missing, yes? You haven't used them up. Let's see if we can make a good use of them. What did they look like as modules? They looked something like this, yes. Let's say the one at the base of one of those tubes, it looked like this. I'll call this one M lambda. Lambda is any scalar. And there was another one that looked like those. 
Yes, but with a zero on top. Sorry, a zero at the bottom and a one on top. I'll call this one M infinity. It corresponds to the point at infinity in the projective line in my P1 family of tubes. <coughs> and what happens if I apply the cluster character to those? Yes? So these... Uh, it should be noted that in the cluster category, if you try to take the suspension of any of these, you get the same module or the same object. So when you try to compute the index of these, all you have to do is compute the projective presentation of this module itself. Yes. <clears throat> so a projective, a minimal, projective presentation of M lambda looks like this. <clears throat> you have M lambda on one side, and then you need to take surjections, so that's M lambda. And I claim that a minimal projective presentation has the form P1 goes to P2 goes to M lambda. And you can make this explicit, yes? P2, what is P2? It's a module that looks like this. What is P1? P1 is a one-dimensional module. <clears throat> and the morphisms you can explicit the morphisms of representations. And one choice you can make is the following. So the important thing is that whatever, you, whatever lambda you choose, it's always P2 and P1 that appear here. So the index doesn't depend on lambda. However, the morphisms, they do depend on lambda, yes. This morphism in particular, this morphism between P1 and P2, it depends on lambda. If you change the lambda here, you change the lambda here. Okay? We'll come back to this. <coughs> oh, this hasn't started. That's okay. Next, you can compute the F polynomial of this module. And it's a good exercise, but it's not so hard to convince yourselves that there are only three submodules of this module. The zero module, a simple module at one, and the whole module. So the F polynomial looks like this. 1 plus Y1 plus Y1, Y2. And finally, if you compute the cluster character, you have the index, you have the F polynomial. You can compute F, the, uh, the cluster character. And what you get is the element set. So the upshot is that we can categorify this element, yes? This element is the cluster character applied to any module at the base of any of these tubes. Yes? There are several possible choices, but I'd like this one. It suits my purposes better. Because this one I can categorify as well, very easily. Because if you take the nth power here, you just need to take n of these modules, take their direct sum, 
And it will be sent to z to the power n, yes? This is cc of m lambda 1 plus m lambda 2 plus plus m lambda n. Oh, yes, n, that's fine. n lambda n. So you can categorify the whole basis in this way. <clears throat> so if maybe, if, yes, please. So the, the, the F polynomial, a priori, we would expect it to depend on lambda, but it turns out that it doesn't, because whatever lambda is here, you will only find three submodules. The y hats only depend on the quiver. I, I did not hear, I'm sorry. If I have, what is, what is the last sentence? Yes. Uh, no, 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 lambda, lambda is not a number of arrows. Lambda is not a number of arrows. The quiver, the quiver looks like this. Yes. And then I'm looking at the representation of this quiver. This is a representation of the quiver. So I, I've put a vector space at every vertex, and I've put a linear map for every arrow. And my linear maps, these are vector spaces of dimension 1. So I write my linear maps as matrices of size 1, 1. So oh, maybe I could write these guys as matrices, yes, but since they are matrices, one by one matrices, I just write them as scalars. So lambda, lambda is any scalar in my field. It, it turns out it doesn't. So you have, that's, that's part of the magic, and this is where we, this is the first observation where we will uh, and we will continue from there, is that you have a whole family of modules here such that when you apply the cluster character to them, you always get the same answer. <clears throat> and also, very importantly, if you look at their projective presentations, they all look the same. They only differ by a certain scalar in the matrix of dysmorphism. Okay, so what, what do we want to observe? So one thing I've said, we have a whole family of objects that have the same cluster character. A whole P1 family. Of objects in CQ are sent to Z by the cluster character. And of course, all these objects have the same index. So now what we'll do is, is 
think slightly backwards with respect to what we've been doing up to now. You take an object, you compute its index, compute its f polynomial, compute the cluster character. We'll do the opposite now. So instead of taking an object and computing this sequence that allows you to compute the index, we'll start with this part. We'll put a morphism here, and we'll take the co-kernel. And then the co-kernel will have this as a projective presentation, by definition. Yes. So in the cluster category, we'll have T1, T0, two objects in add T. We'll put a morphism in between, and we'll take the cone. It exists. It's unique up to isomorphism. Yes. This object will have a specified index. And we'll look at all objects having the same index. And it'll turn out that most of them will look the same, in the sense that they will have the same cluster character. So that's the general idea. So what are we doing here in this very specific example? If you look at the morphism space between T1 and T2, Uh, this is a two-dimensional space. It's isomorphic to the set of morphisms between P1 and P2 in the module category. <clears throat> yes, and you can see why this is, yes? If you write P1 and P2 and you try to see what possible morphisms this should be a zero, really. What possible morphisms there are between P1 and P2, you write them as matrices, you don't have so many possibilities, yes? P1 is zero goes to K, P2 is K goes to K2, and zero, zero, one. And then you try to have a morphism between the two. Yes, this is P1, this is P2. And you need to put a matrix AB here such that the two squares commute. Well, the two squares automatically commute because you start for, they both start from zero. So this is equal to this is equal to zero. And it also works with the right arrows. This is equal to this because it's equal to zero. So you can choose whatever you like here, A and B. And should be vertical, really. And for almost all choices of A and B, the co-kernel will have the form M lambda, yes? As long as at least one of them is non-zero, then the co-kernel will have the form M lambda. If, if both are zero, then the co-kernel is going to be P2. Yes. Yes, so for almost all choices of A and B, the co-kernel of AB will have the form M lambda. And what do I mean by almost all? I really mean for all those who are non-zero. Yes, I just need A different from zero or B different from zero. These are open conditions. Yes, if, if you If I view the home space between T1 and T2, so this is a two-dimensional K vector space, but I view it as an affine space, as an affine space A2, then there, there's an open and dense subset, a Zariski open subset of it satisfying this condition, yes, because these are non-equalities of polynomials in A and B. Yes, there is 
a Zavisky open and dense subset of it uh, whose morphisms satisfy the above. Okay. <clears throat> and this will now be uh, our starting point for the definition of generic cluster character. So this idea we will generalize. From now on, instead of starting with an object, and trying to compute its index by trying to find this nice triangle with T0 and T1. We will fix T0 and T1 and add T. We'll look at all morphisms between them, look at all possible cones, and compute the cluster character, and see if there wouldn't be one answer that happens more often than others. That's the idea. So let's give some definitions. So as before, you fix a cluster tilting object T in the cluster category. And now we will fix two objects in at T. Fix T1 and T0 in add T. So these are two objects in at T. They will play the role of P1 and P2 in my example. <clears throat> and now I consider, uh, I consider the space of morphisms between them. And I view this, of course this is a vector space over K, K, K is equal to C, yes, as, as always, yes. <laughs> Um, this is a vector space over K, and I view it as an affine space. Yes, I want to look at sets, well, Zariski closed and Zariski open sets in there as an affine space over K is equal to C. Now, if I take any morphism in there for any F in there, I can consider its cone. I have F is a morphism from T1 to T0. To T and the cluster category is a triangulated category. So I can complete this into a triangle. And the object here I'll call a cone of F. <clears throat> That's an object in the cluster category. And I can apply the cluster character to it. So I'll define. I'll say that the cluster character applied to the morphism by definition will be the cluster character applied to its cone. Yes. So maybe a remark. When you try to compute this, you'll need to compute the index of the cone but the index of the cone is given here already by definition. In fact, I've given you the index of this object, of this cone, even before I've given you the object. Yes. So remark, the index of the cone of F is always T0 minus T1 in the growth index group of at T. And this doesn't depend on F. <clears throat> um, yeah, I'm not going to need this anymore. So maybe some examples. 
uh, what happens if f is zero? So I always start with the stupid example, and the stupid example seems to always be equal to zero in some, in some sense. So if f is zero, then the cone of f is just the direct sum of t zero, t zero, and the suspension of t one. So you, so c. CC of F is going to be CC of T0 times CC of the suspension of T1. <clears throat> and then you can compute them. And let me just say that this is an example as before. So in the example of the Kronecker, if you fix T1 and T2 to be the shifts of the projectives, then you can recover the example here. Yes, please. Yes? Yes? Yeah, lambda is in P1, yes? 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 So I need that one of them is non-zero, which is my condition here. <clears throat> but if A is equal to zero, you don't get M lambda of this form, you get M infinity. But it still works. So you get the previous example. Now, one thing that I will not prove, I will simply state it, is that when you perform, when you play this game, you fix T1 and T0, you look at all morphisms between them, you take their cones, and then you, take, you apply the cluster character, you will almost always get the same answer. And by almost always, well, if you, if something is almost always true in, a, in an algebraic variety, in an affine space in this case, you should translate it as saying that there's an open dense subset inside which the property is true. So this is a theorem. So there is a Zariski open and dense subset U of the space of morphisms between T1 and T0 such that if I take any two morphisms in U, their cluster character is the same. The proof of this theorem requires some tools from algeb algebraic geometry applied to complex varieties. I don't want to talk about this. But we've seen this in action in the case of the Kronecker quiver, yes? For almost all morphisms here, in a Zariski dense open subset of morphisms here, the co kernel always had the same, well, the cone, sorry, always had the same cluster character. And it was always Z. So definition, 
if I fix T1 and T0, I have a well-defined element in the ring in the ring of Laurent polynomials in X1 up to Xn. This will be called the generic cluster character. So let me give you uh, a bit of uh, notation first. So if you fix fix a vector of integers g1 up to gn, I want this vector of integers to act as the index of some object. So define define t0 to be the direct sum, t0 of g, sorry, to be the direct sum of all ti's to the power of gi whenever gi is positive. And define t1 of g to be the direct sum of all ti to the minus gi whenever gi is negative. Yes, in other words, I'm giving you integers here, and I'm using this integer just to, as a way to encode what is the composition of t0 and t1, yes? Whenever one of these entries is positive, if the ith entry is positive, it's giving me the number of time ti appears as a direct sum end of t0 of g. And whenever it is negative, it gives me how many times ti appears as a direct sum end of t1 of g. Yes. In particular, t0 and t1 don't have any direct sum end in common. Yes. So that's a bit of notation. And now the generic cluster character of G is then defined to be the value that appears in the theorem applied to T1 of G and T0 of G is uh, defined as follows. So the, um, by the previous theorem, there exists a Zariski open and dense subset U in the space of morphisms between T1 of G and T0 of G such that if you take any morphisms in there, the cluster character applied to them is the same. And you, take the, you define the generic cluster character of G to be this value that happens almost everywhere in this space. Yes. So in our example of the Kronecker, if I take g to be minus 1, 1, that was the index of m lambda, then almost all objects of that index were sent to z. This is what we have computed. So we've given definitions that specialize to what we saw on the example of the Kronecker. And I'll let G 
be the set of all generic cluster characters. Curly G. It's incredibly quiet all of a sudden. <laughs> Now this, uh, so in the case of the Kronecker, thanks to the theorem that we saw in the beginning, uh, this G, uh, we would like it to be a basis of the cluster algebra. And this will happen to be true. So uh, always as an example, always for the Kronecker, uh, G is the basis uh, of cluster monomials and powers of Z. Now, how, how do we see this? Well, we first have to see that uh, if you have a cluster monomial, then it's going to be in there. And the way to see this is to use a theorem of Dehi and Keller. Cluster monomials, they correspond to rigid objects. Yes, reachable rigid objects. So if you have any object that is rigid, or rather if you have any object And if you look at the triangle that allows you to compute its index, so you have T1x goes to T0x by some morphism F goes to X goes to the suspension of T1x. So that's a triangle with T1 and T0 in at T. Then X is going to be rigid if and only if Almost all morphisms between T1 and T0 have a cone isomorphic to X. And we can be slightly more precise. And X is rigid if and only if the orbit OF of F by the action of what? Of the automorphism group of T1. This acts on the right on F and the automorphism of T0 acting on the left by the action of the automorphism of T1 times the automorphism group of T0 of X. So this acts on F, and when you have it acting on F, it gives you an orbit in the space of morphisms between T1 and T0, and X is rigid if and only if this orbit is open and thus tense. If the, the action, the orbit da, 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 is a Zariski open dense subset of the space of morphisms here. So cluster characters apply to rigid objects are in this set G. So a consequence G contains all cluster monomials. So this is always true. More generally, G contains CC of X for all X rigid. Yes, X doesn't have to be reachable. 
Now we've seen in, in uh, John's talk yesterday that if you make an assumption on the matrix of your cluster algebra, if you assume that it has full rank, then elements with different G vectors are linearly independent. So if, if you make this assumption almost by definition, well, by definition, all elements in the set curly G will be linearly independent. Yes? So, I don't know, uh, maybe I'll call this a proposition. If we assume that the matrix has full rank, then elements of curly G, so all generic cluster characters are linearly independent. So it means that if you could find, you could theoretically find the basis of the cluster algebra containing the cluster monomials, because in this case the cluster monomials are in G and they are linearly independent. But as Bernhard say, you can prove this more generally for the cluster monomials. But maybe I'll write this as a question in general. Are elements in G linearly independent? And I don't know the answer to this question. Yes, uh, that's the curly G. Uh, what is it? Oh, sorry. It's the set of all generic cluster characters. So it's a set parametrized by Zn. Now, okay, cluster monomials, we know that they're part of the cluster algebra. Good. Uh, if you take any object of the cluster category, a priori, there's no reason why applying the cluster character to it should give you something in the cluster algebra. It's just a Laurent polynomial, yes. Cluster algebra is a subring of the Laurent polynomial ring. In order to try and answer this question, you need to look at what happens to the generic cluster characters when you mutate the initial cluster tilting object. I'll write this theorem of invariance under mutation. So let T be a cluster tilting object, CPO, and let mu I of T, this was, will, will be T prime. That's one of its mutations. We saw how to mutate those yesterday. Uh, let, now, if you fix T, you have a cluster character. If you change T, you have another cluster character. So I'll introduce just a bit of notations. Normally, I just write CC for the cluster character. And I'm not telling you what T is. It's, it's uh, not that it's implicit. But I'll make it explicit. So CC index T will be the cluster character associated to T. And CC T prime is the cluster character associated to T prime. Now, if you start from Zn, you have a definition of generic cluster characters. For any element of Zn, any G in Zn, you have a generic cluster character here. And this falls. Well, it's a Laurent polynomial, but let me write it more generally as a, as a rational function in x1 and xn, up to xn. The image of this is curly G. Now this, you should really think of as K of at T, K zero of at T. Now on the other side, I mean, if you mutate 
t to get t prime. You can play the same game. You can look at all generic cluster characters with respect to t prime. And you end up somewhere in here. And this, of course, this set n, now you view it as k0 of add t prime. Now, when you mutate uh, your initial cluster tilting object, and if you fix an object x, you have an index with respect to the first object t. And it's going to have an index with respect to the second object t prime. And it turns out that you can, you can see how this changes. So you have a rule of mutation here for indexes, indices. And the rule is the following. So this mu i here, how does it work? So mu i of g is going to be g prime where the jth coordinate is defined either as minus g i if i is equal to j or g j minus m times this thing here. When, whenever I write something like this, I mean the maximum between 0 and w. The positive part of w in some sense. This is if there are m arrows from i to j, or finally gj plus m times the positive part of gi if there are m arrows from j to i. So that's a mutation rule. I'm just writing it down for completeness. So you have an index here. You can mutate it into a new index here. I've written this more here. In QT, yes, thank you. And of course you have mutation at the level here, yes. The mutation of cluster variables gives you an automorphism of this field of rational function, which I'll denote by an outrageous abuse of notation with the same letter. And the theorem is that this squares commute. Yes. You can send, you will send, uh, for i different from j, you will send xj to xj, and xi you will send to the mutation of xi, yes. with respect to uh, your initial seed here. So you will send it to 1 over xi times two monomials, yes, uh, this is the exchange relation. So it gives you an automorphism. And a corollary of this theorem is that if you mutate your initial seed, the generic cluster character is always a Laurent polynomial with respect to any seed. So generic cluster characters are in the upper cluster algebra. Um, but not in the cluster algebra in general. The first example 
that I knew of was for this quiver. For this quiver, if you take a good potential on this, a good generic or non-degenerate potential on this, and you look at the generalized cluster category, uh, you will get that the set of generic cluster characters is contained in the upper cluster algebra, but not in the cluster algebra itself. Uh, no, this is the cluster algebra. Let's say the upper cluster algebra I usually denoted by U. So G is in the upper cluster algebra, but not in the cluster algebra. So you always have such an inclusion, but in most of the times it's not equal. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, I'll have to think about it. I think it's yes, but I'm not sure anymore. Guys, <laughs> we are getting at one variable x i. Yes. And somehow we are ensured that mutating at one variable will. Uh, then rate the rational function to be like Yes. Why is that uh, true? The, well, you can, you can, the, mm. if, if you have, this is general, if you have any, any cluster, any seed, so that means that generates this field, so the u1 up to un are rational functions in x1 up to xn. It's always true that if you mutate in any direction, u prime generates the field again. And the reason is simply that you can reobtain all the elements in u. You can reobtain a set of generator, yeah? If, if you look at this mutation of i, well, on, on this side, all the xj's remain the same. And in the numerator here, you only get the xj's that are different from xi. You can divide by them or multiply by them, and you get the inv uh, divide by, by the sum, you, you get the inverse of xi. And you're in a field, so you get xi as well. OK. I'd like to quickly say something about generic decomposition of indices. And if, if you take any morphism from T1 to T0, uh, sometimes you can decompose this as a direct sum of other morphism. You say, let's say it's in the composable. Say F is in the composable. If whenever you write the morphism from, from T1 to T0 as being isomorphic to some direct sum of two other morphisms, this implies that one of these is a morphism between zero objects. So. Now say that an element G in Zn is in the composable if almost all morphisms between T1 of G and T0 of G are in the composable. So if there exists an open, dense, 
u in the set of morphisms from t1 of g to t0 of g, such that for all f in u, f is indecomposable. So generically, morphism in this morphism space are indecomposable. And the theorem is that if you take any g in Zn, most of the morphisms in here, so generic morphisms in here, or if you like, morphisms in an open dense subset in here, will decompose in the same way. Yes, so if you let g be in Zn, then there exist in the composable vectors g1 up to, say, gr in Zn, unique up to isomorphism, uh, unique up to, sorry, reordering, and such that, well, there exists an open dense subset U in the space of morphisms from T1 G to T0 of G, such that all morphisms F in U decompose as morphisms F1 up to FR, whose indices correspond to G1 up to GR. So F is a direct sum F1 up to FR with all, each FI in home of T1 GI to T0 of GI. case, you write, that's a notation, you write G as being G1 direct sum G2 direct sum da 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 direct sum GR. And this is interesting because if you, if you want to apply to compute the generic cluster character of G, <clears throat> you just need to compute the generic cluster character of these indecomposable indices. And I would like to finish by drawing a picture <clears throat> showing you all indecomposable indices in the case of the Kronecker quiver. These are two by two, two by one vectors. Vectors in the plane, integer vectors in the plane. Now we know that T1 and T2 have indices one, zero, and zero, one. So I'll have at least these two. I also know that the suspension of T1 and T2 have, have indices minus one, zero, and zero minus one. So I should have these two. Now cluster variables are generic cluster characters and they come from indecomposable rigid objects. So the G vector, so, sorry, the index of an indecomposable rigid object will always be an indecomposable index. And in the case of the Kronecker, we've, we can compute all indices of the uh, rigid in the composable. And they look like this. On one side, you have, say, 
uh, minus 1, 2, maybe minus 2, 3. I'm not very good at drawing things up to scale, yes, but uh, you'll have a bunch of them looking like minus n, n plus 1. But you will never attain the line minus 1, 1. And on the other side, you can approach it as well. Yes, you will have a bunch of g-vectors going closer and closer. And these will look like minus n plus 1, n. And finally, the index of the object at the, as the, at the base of the tube is also an indecomposable index. And the index of this one was minus 1, 1. And this is the picture. I wanted to you to see this picture. It's an important picture. Uh, it's the picture of all indecomposable g vectors. You might have seen this in other contexts. And I would say that this is not a coincidence. If you have, I will end with this. Thank you.